I want to share the best vitamin to help shrink a fibroid. So what is a fibroid? A fibroid is a growth, but it's not cancerous. Fibroids are the number one reason why women get hysterectomies. Uh, fibroids are very, very common. Um, I saw one reference that 20 to 50% of all women before the age of 50 have some type of growth or fibroid or endometriosis. So first, let's start with the uterus. What is the uterus? Well, it's part muscle and part gland. You can look at the uterus like the soil where the seed or an egg implants and starts growing. And so it's really nutrient dense. It's rich. It feeds the egg once it's fertilized. And the uterus has incredible regenerative properties. I mean, researchers are now looking at how can they use that in different places in the body to help regenerate the tissues. The other thing that's fascinating about the uterus is that it has the ability to expand by 500x. And of course, I shared that information with my wife, Karen, and her reply was, you think I don't know that after three kids? So of course, I quickly dropped that conversation. Here's the information I stumbled on relating to fibroids. There's been some studies that show that vitamin D can help reduce the size of a fibroid. Now, why would vitamin D actually help you shrink a fibroid? A vitamin D regulates the genes that control growth. And in one of the papers I found, the vitamin D receptor in a fibroid are very different versus normal uterus tissue. That means that the fibrous tissue is not going to receive as much vitamin D, which means it's going to have less control over the growth. I mean, if you think about it, vitamin D really isn't a vitamin. It's a hormone. When someone's vitamin D deficient, they're a lot more at risk of developing fibroids, and the uterus is very hormone sensitive. And so there's an enzyme called aromatase that converts androgens to estrogen. And so there's all sorts of uh, remedies and even medications that can act as an aromatase inhibitor. And guess what? Vitamin D is a natural aromatase inhibitor. Also, vitamin D can create an effect on the fibroid itself. If you have enough vitamin D, certain tumors and even cancers uh, will start committing suicide. Now, that is a normal process when a cell is damaged. But the thing about cancer and tumors, the problem with that is that somehow that controlled cell death, where the cell becomes damaged and starts committing suicide, and now the cancer cell, the tumor cell just keeps growing, growing, growing. But vitamin D can help increase that apoptosis in the fibroid. Now, I'm going to explain how much vitamin D to take to create this effect. But I just wanted to mention uh, a Dr. Bruce Hollis, who basically did a lot of the original research on vitamin D. And he's a professor and he has over 500 papers, okay, mostly related to vitamin D. And in some of his videos, it's very interesting because... This is what he said. He said that uh, a lot of the positive result type studies in vitamin D are rejected by the top journals. And he left me with an impression that it's almost as if they don't want people to know about this positive vitamin D effect. Now, relating to that, I want to bring up another study. It's a quite large study, which was called the Vital Study. So this was a study involving 25,000 adults. It's a quite large study. And apparently it was no benefit to vitamin D or omega-3 in reducing major cardiovascular events or cancer. If we actually read the study, there's a couple things about this study that's a little fishy. The analysis of the uh, study excluded the first two years of follow-up, which showed significant reduction of cancer. Number two, if you separate out the people that actually weren't overweight versus the overweight and obese people, there was a much lower risk of getting cancer for the people that had normal weight. Now, the reason I'm bringing that up is because people that are obese, overweight, need more vitamin D because vitamin D gets stored in the fat cells. And if someone is obese, that vitamin D is going to be diluted. They also admitted some limitations. One is there was only one dose of vitamin D per day. You think 10,000? No, 2,000 I use. They're calling 
2,000 IUs high dose vitamin D. Also, there's data to indicate that they really uh, did not follow the criteria for a true randomized placebo controlled trial. They also omitted the information on exposure to sun, how much people were outside versus inside. They didn't follow up and assess uh, vitamin D in 94% of the participants. So what would I do if I had a fibroid? I would take about 50,000 IUs of vitamin D. Now, I know what you're thinking, boy, that's a lot. That's a toxic amount. What am I going to do about the side effects of that, et cetera? But if you take vitamin K2, you take magnesium, zinc, boron, vitamin B6, these are all the cofactors that protect you against hypercalcemia, too much calcium in the blood. And if you're taking 50,000 IUs of vitamin D3 every day, uh, the amount of K2 that you would need, I would take about 500 micrograms with that. I would also take 800 milligrams of magnesium, very important. Magnesium will help reduce the calcium formation. I would also take 50 milligrams of zinc. And then I would also take vitamin B6 and boron. And as far as the amounts, whatever's recommended on the bottle. I would also get on the ketogenic diet. Why? To reduce my insulin because insulin can actually increase the growth of fibroids. And lastly, I would be consuming a good amount of cruciferous vegetables to help any other things that can mimic estrogen. Also, I would limit the amount of milk you consume. Milk is used to grow a calf, so there's a lot of growth factors, but also the calcium in milk, right, can be another situation that you want to reduce if you're taking a lot of vitamin D. And the next video you really need to know about is this vitamin D toxicity topic. I don't even believe vitamin D toxicity comes from the vitamin D. I think it's the lack of cofactors. And for that information, check out this video right here. I'm actually convinced that there's no such thing as a true vitamin D toxicity problem. Now, what I'm not saying is that a person, if they take higher amounts of vitamin D, they won't get some symptoms, but the actual cause of those symptoms, I don't believe is coming from high doses of vitamin D3. I think it's coming from a deficiency of the cofactors for vitamin D, primarily from a magnesium deficiency and a vitamin K2 deficiency, and there's a couple others as well. Now, we know most people are deficient in magnesium going into this. So if you're not taking enough magnesium while you're taking vitamin D, I think you're going to start noticing some of the symptoms that people call vitamin D toxicity, which are irritability, insomnia, constipation, fatigue, muscle spasm or cramps, calcification, calcium that builds up, and arrhythmia. But there are also symptoms of low magnesium as well as symptoms of low vitamin K2. I mean, if you just look at the case studies or some of the studies of vitamin D toxicity, you don't normally see they're taking magnesium with it. They're not taking K2 with it. Many times they're taking vitamin D2, not D3 as well. Now, you don't want to take calcium when you're testing for vitamin D toxicity because the symptom is hypercalcemia, which is too much calcium in the blood. Why would you want to take calcium? It doesn't make sense. Now, I found something interesting on Wikipedia I want to share with you. It said, it is possible that some of the symptoms of vitamin D toxicity are actually due to vitamin K depletion. And they're talking about vitamin K2. And yeah, I think we already knew that. Vitamin K2 is needed to prevent the calcium from building up in the soft tissues. Vitamin D helps increase calcium absorption in the small intestine by 20 times. So now we have all this calcium in the blood. Vitamin K2 comes in there and takes it from the blood into the tissues, preventing buildup of soft tissue calcium. And also magnesium is one of the best antidotes to prevent kidney stones. The toxicity symptoms from vitamin D, I believe, are just lacking the cofactors. And the reason I'm even talking about this is that it's very important to take therapeutic doses of vitamin D to deal with certain conditions. Amount that's recommended by the Mayo Clinic is like 600 IUs. This is ridiculous. When you're out in the sun 
for about 30 minutes, maybe 40 minutes, you're going to get at least 20,000 IUs of vitamin D3. Now, why would the RDAs be only 600 IUs? And why would someone be nervous or concerned by taking a maintenance dosage of 10,000 IUs per day when you get 10,000 or 20,000 IUs just from being out in the sun? There is also some data out there. People will say that, well, once you get a certain amount of vitamin D from the sun, your body will just stop making vitamin D. I try to find that data. I couldn't find uh, any evidence that being true, but I did find an interesting research article on lifeguards in Israel. And what was interesting, unique about these lifeguards, that there was a 20 times increased risk of getting kidney stones, probably because they got a lot of vitamin D and they didn't have enough K2 or magnesium. Now, let's talk about vitamin D as far as the therapeutic dose for certain conditions, especially autoimmune conditions. Dr. Combra from Brazil has an amazing protocol, I mean, with thousands of success stories. And he uses between 50,000 to 80,000 to 100,000 to up to 200,000 IUs of vitamin D3 to put these autoimmune cases in remission. And what he does is he just uh, monitors the parathyroid gland, right? Because the parathyroid gland controls calcium. So if you're low in calcium, the parathyroid gland will kind of make up the difference and raise up and start pulling calcium from your bone. So if your parathyroid hormone is high, that means you're low in calcium or low in vitamin D. And if your parathyroid hormone is low, that means you have enough calcium or you have enough vitamin D. And when you get into autoimmune diseases, you have this very unique situation. You may have normal amounts of vitamin D in the blood, but at the receptor, it's not really working for a whole number of reasons. What this doctor does is give you more vitamin D to penetrate through this resistance and also realize when they do a blood test for vitamin D, they're not measuring what's happening at receptor level. There is no agreed upon amount of vitamin D in the blood as a certain thing that everyone agrees on in the medical profession. In other words, the normal amounts of vitamin D in our blood are still uncertain. We don't really know. There's a very interesting book I just read by Dr. Harold Sheely. He's an ophthalmologist. This is what he said, anything less than 150 nanograms per milliliter will likely not work because his focus was on the eye and he would use higher doses of vitamin D to get great results, which is just quite fascinating. Now you might say, well, if it works so great, why doesn't everyone know about it? Well, because it works so great. Even if you question vitamin D for various remedies, you get attacked. I won't be surprised if I get attacked for this video by other doctors on this topic, but I'm trying to give you all the data to think with it because I think the danger is in the lack of the cofactors for vitamin D more than the D itself. Vitamin D is just really hard to get. You take a 70-year-old and a 20-year-old and you put them out in the sun for a period of time the 70 year old will get 75% less vitamin D because their skin is older. So number one, when you take vitamin D, also take magnesium, also take vitamin K2. Also boron is a cofactor for vitamin D and magnesium. Zinc is also another cofactor, very important. And lastly, vitamin A. Now that I talked about the toxicity, let's focus in on the therapeutic benefits of vitamin D from this video right here. Check it out.